you know that the history of inequality and the undoing of inequality is a long history, right? So I've, I mean, I've lived through chapters of this. I, I lived through the civil rights movement, I lived through the women's rights movement, and I've lived through the gay rights movement. Now, in the future, do you think that people will look back at this time as a time when everything was just as it should be and no one was in any way con con constrained or restrained? And I suppose it was in the summer when I was coming in that I first heard the story that the campus had been devised by an African-American architect in the middle of segregation. Full extent from beyond the football stadium past the hospital was a pine forest and a pig farm. Okay, so everything that is now Gothic Duke in, uh, down through past Wallace Way was designed in one coherent act. Uh, he picked the, the Trumbauer firm in Philadelphia uh, and they put their best architect on it. This was a, a black architect, Julian Abel. The soaring spire of volcanic stone that towers over the campus of Duke University has forever been shrouded in mystery. Scholars know it as an icon, a home base, a reminder of power and the genius of the human mind. Having stood on Duke's highest ridge for nearly a century, the chapel has looked down upon its quadrangle to see cycles of protest bringing change, and change bringing celebration. When the chapel's first stone was laid, times were starkly different. Segregation permeated the South, its people, and its customs. When James Buchanan Duke first tread across the grounds of Trinity College in 1924 and resolved to endow a project that would fundamentally transform his legacy, it was unheard of in the tobacco town of Durham, North Carolina, that he would commission the Horace Chumbauer firm of Philadelphia and its chief black architect, Julian Abel. But outside the South, Duke's decision would have never been questioned. Having graduated first in his class from the University of Pennsylvania, studied in Europe, and built the likes of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Philadelphia Free Library, and the Harvard Library, Abel showcased a talent and prestige like no other architect at the time. From hundreds of miles away, Abel worked seamlessly over the course of a quarter century to etch the lines and shadows that guided the construction of what historians have described as a celestial Gothic village put down in a Renaissance garden. So we don't know for sure whether he came onto the campus or not. We've heard stories of both ways. Um, we know that if he did come, it was only once or twice at the most. Um, he may not have wanted to come because he would have had to stay in segregated facilities, take segregated transportation, um, and may not have not come on to the campus often, partly because of the um, segregated um, uh, situation in the South. Yet as Abel's masterpiece burgeoned and captured attention from across the world, Duke administration kept evidence of his contributions behind closed doors. With aging blueprints, a single correspondence letter, and word of mouth left as the sole authenticators of Abel's work, the diligence of the man behind Duke's gothic allure over time grew into a story long forgotten. In the spring of 1986, Duke students protesting Duke's investments in apartheid South Africa erected shanties in the main quadrangle. Amidst the uproar arose an astonishing revelation. It was called a shanty town. And someone wrote a letter to the Duke Chronicle saying, you know, these are so ugly, they're really awful to have up here. I don't think the designers of the campus would want to see you know, such ugly structures on this beautiful campus. 
And a woman named Susan Cook, who was a student, wrote and said, well, my great uncle was Julian Abel. He was the designer of the campus. He was African-American, and he would have understood why this protest is happening and why it's important. And that sort of alerted a lot of people who hadn't previously known about it to the fact that um, Abel, an African-American, was um, one of the driving forces be behind the, the buildings on campus. It's not, it's not surprising that his identity wasn't proclaimed down here. Uh, you know, let's, let's, let's not forget uh, that in the days of segregation, this was not, not only a legal policy, but it was one that people on every side of the color line had internalized for generations by this, by, by this point. Right. Cook's testimony revived a buried history that stoked new conversation across campus. Within months, administration commissioned a portrait of Abel that hangs in the Allen Building to this day. The Black Student Alliance began an annual honorary Julian Abel banquet and award ceremony. In 1988, the conversation shifted from Duke's investments in South Africa to diversity issues on campus. Black students protested minimal numbers of black faculty members, and administration responded by launching the Black Faculty Initiative, which aimed to increase numbers of black faculty members in all departments. In 1997, the Black Student Alliance organized a three-hour sit-in in the Perkins Library due to failures to meet those 1988 demands. Administration quelled the protest by making even heftier promises. Since, the school has steadily driven to increase faculty diversity, and with new emphases on financial aid and affordability, it has opened the doors to students who come from all walks of life. I think because I don't think that in this moment, I don't know that diversity is the most important issue. Um, I think diversity and inclusion go hand in hand because diversity, right, is bringing new faces or new people with new experiences into a space. Inclusion is making sure that the space that they're entering into is open, is open and safe and welcoming enough for them to exist um, as comfortably as students of any other background. And so I think Duke has already kind of done a lot of the work of diversity um, in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality. I see our student body as representative of a wide range of, of, um, of student backgrounds. What I don't always see is the, uh, the necessary commitment to, um, to making sure that spaces on the campus um, are, are welcoming or safe enough for students of certain um, racial and ethnic, um, sexual, gender minorities. Authorities at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, are trying to figure out who hung a rope noose on campus. The noose was found hanging from a tree outside the Student Commons building early Wednesday. Duke's president described the news as a reminder of the South's painful racial history and the lynchings that were once used to terrorize black residents. A noose hanging in a tree in a southern state of the United States, this is a symbol that is an allusion to the, uh, to the history of lynching. We are not at Duke University are protesting three administrators and asking for them to resign from their positions after one of those administrators allegedly hit a parking attendant, a contracted parking attendant with his car, and then uh, allegedly used a racial slur to refer to her. You, you late. We here. We ready. Where you? You late. We demand that Talbot Trask issue a public apology to Ms. Underwood. for this hateful, violent, and negligent actions. <laughs> Apart from demands for Trask's dismissal, protesters demanded a list of action items from the university, from increasing diversity in admissions to paying living wages to Duke staff. But no demand on the list attracted as much attention as did demands to dedicate the school's immaculate new student union to Julian Abel's namesake. BSA was not responsible for producing those demands, but because we are kind of an organization that's constantly 
um, in kind of contact with administrators about uh, black student concerns on campus, we were kind of a mediator between the group of students who wrote the demands and the administrators, such that we were talking to them constantly about the need to have some kind of formal recognition of the work that you were able. Because the other thing is that, right, so a lot of students didn't know about Julian Abel until his dedication, but this is a this is a history that Black students are constantly reminded of. And so of. there have been things that particular groups on campus have done to bring attention to Abel, but until the renaming of the Quad, there wasn't um, a huge push by the, the central administration to do so. So there were a number of different possibilities considered. Um, Naming of a building, naming of a street, naming of a quad, um, a public art installation, um, a book, a number of different things were, were considered. Um, you know, some of the, the factors into deciding had to do with um, what would be appropriate to, to honor Abel. So we didn't want to name a building that he hadn't designed or a building that, um, you know, had been radically renovated since he had designed it, because we wanted it to, to kind of connect to his work directly, so we didn't. Uh, so just talking about this with the committee, uh, the, uh, the idea came up, what if we named the whole quad, the whole, uh, and what if you smacked down right in the middle of the quad something that told every passerby what this history was? Um, you know, and I said at the dedication, something you'll find in those remarks, uh, if you wander through classical Rome, you'll come across a certain kind of tombstone or monument. Uh, and it begins with the phrase, Siste, siste viator, or viator, stop, halt, traveler. Uh, so the whole point is, you're going on your busy way, stop a minute, I want to tell you something. And so that's what this, I, that to me, what this plaque does out there. Every time I walk from here to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, the plaza, uh, to the uh, uh, West Union, I stop when I get there because it says that a black architect in the depths of segregation devised every building you can see from this site. And then there's a line that you know is quoted from the monument to uh, uh, Christopher Wren in St. Paul's Cathedral. If you see his, seek his monument, look about you. I consider this the finest campus in this country. Thought a little bit about how dad would react to this situation hoping somehow that he could see what was happening here and be able to enjoy it without feeling that he was in the limelight. When I walk past the chapel, I see something that's bigger than myself. Knowing Julian Abel's life story makes me believe that I too can create something as phenomenal as the buildings that we see around us. Perhaps one of my favorite quotes from Mr. Abel, who is always so humble. The lines are all Trumbauer's, he said, the shadows are mine. Well, no longer, sir. We thank you for your shadows, your lines, and your beauty. And we welcome you into the light of Duke's campus today. It was phenomenal. The number of people who came to it, the happiness. Uh, the guy who designed the new museum, the, the African American Museum on the Mall in Washington, who lives in this city, uh, was there. Uh, uh, the, the, the grandson, the, the son of Julian Abel, every one of his living relatives were all there. Uh, they, were so, they were so thrilled, uh, 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 not only at the fact of the commemoration, but of the, but of the choice of the nature of the commemoration. So I think it really amazing that despite the fact that, you know, the kind of, um, the kind of racial tensions that existed during the time where um, he was designing this campus, that, you know, um, so many years later, we can change the way that that narrative is constructed to include a more inclusive um, form of history that I think is necessary. So, so the dedication itself, uh, as I said, I think it's just, um, it is a representative action, right? So it, for me, uh, does nothing to, to change anything about the racial politics that pervaded the time in which he, uh, Julian Abel, was designing the quad, and it also does nothing to change politics of Duke in this moment. I think what it is is a representation of a necessarily larger commitment to structural changes that would be necessary in order to change the actual uh, experiences of minority people on campus.
dedication of quiet, of, of quiet will never be enough. Um, but I think it is a step in the right direction for, um, for you know, administrators to recognize that this is a part of our history that we had silenced. And um, to have silenced that history was, um, was, was not okay. And so the fact that we had a representative action to kind of change that narrative, I think, was important. But it certainly is not enough in terms of the work that is still left to be done um, on campus. You know, we can bring as many students to campus as we want to who look differently than most of the students who are on campus. But if we're not doing all we can to ensure that their experiences are as rich as they can be, then we have not done enough. Um, so I think. It, it is necessarily both diversity and inclusion that um, the dedication of the quad is a sign of and that the work um, in terms of racial politics especially um, is going to have to be thinking about in order to be successful. Uh, you, you, you hope it will never again be the case that talent is pushed down. You know, I was reading this weekend about the, hist uh, the, the history uh, of caste-based discrimination in India. You know, this is not the only culture that's ever had uh, uh, organized discrimination. Uh, but, you know, cul cultures, it's just, it's a, it's a sickness of humanity that people like to make differences between themselves and others and pretend that people are inferior to themselves and then create social regulations that make that kind of true. Except it never makes it kind of true because people's intelligence, their creativity, their heart, those traits are not suppressed by social regulation. And so for me, that's the Julian Abel story. Although more work needs to be done, the dedication was foremost a step in the right direction. The golden plaque and its namesake serve as an immortal symbol and reminder to all minority students that Duke administration remains committed to fostering an inclusive campus and will recognize all students for their accomplishments, regardless of the color of their skin.